Get started in a moment here. We're waiting on um, our third panelist who's getting some water. And as we wait, thanks to all of you who have joined us via Zoom. Great to see you. Sorry. Um, I'm Dr. Dewan Johnson, and it is a pleasure to see everyone this afternoon for this um, wonderful panel, Invaluable Black Boys at Williamsburg Boys School, 1762. I'm going to read the biography before we, um, before we delve into the, the talk. To my right, we have Dr. Maureen Elderson Lee. She is the Mellon Engagement Coordinator for African American Heritage at William & Mary and serves as the director of the William & Mary School, Gray School Lab. And as a professor for more than two decades, Dr. Elderson Lee has held dynamic length academic and administrative positions, including faculty scholar for the African American Collection of Maine at the University of Southern Maine and executive director of Richmond Black History Museum and Cultural Center in uh, Virginia former department chairperson and award-winning scholar and teacher. Dr. Elgersman Lee has authored and co-authored and edited several books and chapters on women, slavery, community history, and intersectionality in the African diaspora with an emphasis on the United States, Canada, and British Caribbean. Ms. Nicole Brown is a scholar and interpreter of women in Virginia spanning from 1750 to 1800. Mrs. Brown, Graduated from William and Mary in 2013, over the past seven years, the topics of religion, education, and slavery in colonial Virginia have been the focus of her research. As of 2021, Mrs. Brown is completing an MA in American Studies at William and Mary. She is also a Bray School Lab assistant. Her work as a public historian has taken her across the globe. In 2017, Nicole was awarded a short-term fellowship at the International Center for Jefferson Studies in Charlottesville, Virginia to research 18th century women's education. Mrs. Brown also spoke in Reims, France at the 2018 National Association for Interpretations annual conference regarding the efficacy of using character interpretation to discuss challenging topics. In 20, not January 2019, she was awarded the Gonzalez grant by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation to visit the University of Oxford, studying the associates of Dr. Gray and the Church of England's involvement in enslaved education across colonial America. And last but certainly not least, we have Adam Kennedy, who was born in Williamsburg, Virginia. He is an employee of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where he has been involved since the age of five. Mr. Kennedy currently uh, is a carriage driver at the foundation. He gets excitement out of giving those who ride a different truth that they may not have known existed. Adam's passion, his culture, and what motivates him to do more is understanding how much those who came before him did with less. Let's give our panelists an applause. And after they speak, they will open it up for questions and answers. How's everyone doing? Hey. Doing well, doing well. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Adam, um, and I just like to be super duper, uh, you know, genuine and real. Um, it was an absolute like pleasure when Nicole and Maureen like 
told me about this and then you know offered to invite me uh, to speak in front of you all so i don't take that for granted um but i'm just gonna dive right into it uh since we are talking about the brave school and i love talking about culture um the culture of that school uh, is going to be something that deeply shapes the culture of those young children, you know, men, uh, women that are aspiring, you know, to be something, you know, more than what they've never known before. So at that young state, you know, and how we talk about the child's mind is so fragile, but like a sponge, you know, it can be soaked up and develop everything. I always think about what is it that those children you know, we're coming into. How is it that Mrs. Bray, or not Mrs. Bray, Mrs. Wager, is going to shape these kids' roles? It's going to change their lives, not forever, but in a, in a huge way. Um, and then looking at, you know, people like Mr. Carter, you know, who's sending these children there and recommending that they should, you know, be there for at least three years. You know, why is it three years? Why is it not more? Why is it not less? What is it that's the, the big overall picture? Um, and then looking at, you know, in a, in a modern perspective today, uh, for myself, um, education has played a humongous uh, portion um, of shaping my decisions, uh, me staying at the foundation, me deciding to be a carriage driver um, or in, in staying in front of the general public and not being behind. Uh, why is it that I find it you know, so crucial to talk to people one-on-one? -on -one? Um, so I think that's a, a big major uh, key that we sometimes underestimate. Um, the work that, you know, these women are doing, um, it's, it's a job that we can't wait on. So since I've been at the foundation as an adult, I won't say, you know, as a five-year-old, I'll say as an adult, so old enough to understand um, what's, what's been placed in front of me, I've never seen a push, and I'm going to say that again, I have never seen a push that's been this hard for people that look like myself. And for me to be able to wake up and come to work knowing that there's a push and that there's a strong foundation behind that and that there's not going to be someone letting up at the end of it, it means a lot. And if you look at the panel, you know, you got clearly beside me what people would say, oh, it's a white one. And why is she pushing for it? Why isn't she pushing for it is my question. So why isn't she pushing for it? And then you have, you know, another scholar down here who's working within that, that foundation of women married. And that ties us all together. You know, Colonial Williamsburg, the College of Women Mary, and the city of Williamsburg, it's all one chain. It's all one chain, it's not separate. As a young man, I will tell you this, and I have no problem saying it, I never stepped foot on the College of Women Mary's campus until I was 19. And I've lived in Colonial Williamsburg my entire life. Or, and I'll, I'll say this much, why is it that I didn't step on that, that college campus? Was it the access? No, it wasn't the access because the access is there. Did it feel inviting to me? Not really. But what also, you know, was a, a big thing for me was knowing what the College of Women Mary stood for. Mm -hmm. So you can't go to Colonial Williamsburg, live in Williamsburg, and then want to go walk on, you know, the college campus and feel like, oh, this is my home. But the strength of that is knowing that it is your home because who built it? Someone that looked like you. So what does that college represent? Why, why am I not going on that, that campus where my mom told me? So when I said, ah, I'm not going, I'm going to go somewhere where there's a whole bunch more black people that look like me. That was, that was my, my reason. And her thing was, well, how come you aren't going to women marry? How come you aren't telling folks that look like you about women marry? And I had to think, okay, she's got a point there. You never want to you know, tell your mom she's, she's right. But she then you know, told me a little bit more about that college in itself. So if we look at the college you know, in 1693, you look at Williamsburg, 1699, and look at the population of Williamsburg, 52% of Williamsburg is gonna look like myself and look like us in this room and be diverse. We were there. Even if that class wasn't being taught to us, Someone was a waiting boy, was a manservant, was in one of those rooms. They were being educated at the same time. It may not have been written down, but they were still in the room. They were still passing that information. What were they doing when they left those rooms? And when she started to tell me that, it made me kind of look at it a little bit differently. 
um, because that's that's a big, big portion of what's going on in the Bray School. Those kids are going to school and they're being educated. Who are they taking that back to? They're going to take it back to their family. So we've all like heard the story about Night John and uh, writing in the dirt. But as much as, as education, you know, is a, is a big thing for us, I really don't think we, we understand all the ties of it. And those children, when they are coming back to a, a home like Mr. Randolph's property, a home like Mr. Witt, who's, you know, an outstanding individual when it comes to education, they're getting the education in one way, but on the opposite side of it, what are they doing with that education? Are they then picking up those those texts, you know, the Declaration of Independence? Are they then starting to read, you know, things of, of Plato that are inside the house? And are they starting to now yearn for more of a freedom? And to me, that that's that's big when I go out and do that uh, that fifteen minute ride on a carriage to make sure that people understand that it's much more than what we're seeing. Um, so I'm not gonna keep going because I can definitely keep going. But the lady that just walked in right there, that's the one I just threw under the bus right there. So that's my mother. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Mr. Cole. Yeah. And actually, could you go to the next slide really quickly? Because I do want to take a minute to talk about Adam or if you wouldn't mind talking about oh, your, your roots in this community, right? Absolutely. I mean, there. You, how long have you worked at the foundation, actually? All right. So I have worked here. Uh, if you go... From the beginning, 1993 is when I started in Colonial Williamsburg. There's a program called Affairs of the Heart. If you know Christy Coleman, the name was Christy Matthews. She's now uh, over at Jamestown, um, presiding over it. She's the one who kind of got me involved in it. Long story short, I had a speech impediment. Um, my mom was, you know, going to get me out, and she was going to work on it herself because we know how most school systems go. Oh, put him on Ritalin, or he's got ADHD, and there was nothing wrong with me. Um, so. That problem kind of fixed itself and I don't shut up now. <laughs> why I chose these pictures, um, I'll tell you exactly why. The picture that's up in the uh, far left corner there, that's my family. So that's my brothers and my sisters. Uh, and then of course my mom, my aunt, and then you know my nieces and nephews. And that's generations. So to me, generations, hold power, hold legacy. Uh, there's an old African saying, if you lose a man, you lose a library. If you lose a woman, you, lo you lose a university. So, and that's powerful. So each one of us in that picture, we have something that we're gonna give to shape that next mind. And the lady where you see the mouse that's on, if we look at Bruton Heights, we look at First Baptist Church, and we've probably heard that name before, that's my grandmother. That's Clemenza Braxton right there, who was a teacher over at Bruton Heights uh, for quite a while. Um, my uncle, Bobby Braxton, people probably are familiar with him, you know, city councilman. So she raised two powerful men. And, you know, now it's trickled down to myself. Um, and the lady uh, that's there, you know, depending on who you talk to, some people say, man, she was mean as a snake. Other people say, man, and she always was teaching. If I sent her a letter, and it was just, hey, how are you doing? I'm in school, I'm enjoying this. She sent it back in her red, you know, pin marks, you know, <laughs> talking about my punctuation and how mm -hmm. terrible it was. <laughs> so uh, always the educator. Um, and then down in the corner, uh, I was trying to get a good picture of my grandmother, but it's all right, my, my grandmother Flossy, but this will do right here. The young lady that's there, uh, with myself in the uniform, that's my mother. She's the one who was, you know, providing the vehicle to get me to Colonial Williamsburg because a five-year-old isn't taking itself. Um, and also a five-year-old isn't going to want to do it after, you know, an hour. So she was the one that kept telling me that it was much more. It's a bigger picture. Um, and that picture was taken as my second day on, a, on the job as a carriage driver driving. Um, the carriage in the back is a carriage that uh, Queen Elizabeth rode in when she came here in 1957 for her first visit uh, to the foundation. And it also was a pretty cool day as well because that was the 12th year that, you know, Mr. Joe Jones, uh, who had retired from Colonial Williamsburg as our last head coachman, that would have been the anniversary for him. He's still living today. And I'm the first, uh, you know, person of color as a coachman in that, you know, 12 years. And then that picture there in the right-hand corner, 
that's an important picture to me because number one, I was having a ball right there. Two, uh, we were doing a, a film. It's called, uh, um, oh, Lord, just slipped me, but uh, A Day in the Life. Mm -hmm. And A Day in the Life uh, was part of Colonial Williamsburg's electronic field trip series and went out to you know, uh, students um, all across uh, the, the 50 states. Um, that particular one, uh, I was with a bunch of my buddies. So uh, Mr. Watson's son, Dakari Taylor Watson, Kadari Taylor Watson, they were all there. Uh, my cousin, Brandon Lee, whose mom, Sylvia Lee. So it was pretty much a family reunion for us on set. But uh, I look at that as, that's why I love Colonial Mansburg. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as I critique it, because uh, I have no problem calling it out um, and critiquing it, that's why I love it. Because I was there to tell a story, but also to tell the truth. Um, and even I was eight years old in that picture. Even at eight years old, I understood, or I won't say I understood, I was starting to understand you know, the manifestation that was taking place. Um, I knew when I looked around the foundation that I didn't see a whole lot of people that looked like me, but the ones that did look like me, they brought it correct every day. So like Mr. Cook, who just came in, every day he's the thesaurus that brings it and delivers. So I knew I had to, you know, Pretty much, okay. you know, not not let them fall short on saying, oh, Adam's here. And they, oh, gosh, Adam was here. So my thing was always, you know, to be able to uh, stand on their, their shoulders and their, their, be their foundation for the next one. So those are those are cool. And can I actually, Adam, um, are you OK if we miss us also talking about your family going all the way back to the yeah. 18th century? Mm -hmm. So I love that you picked these pictures, especially the one of you um, as an eight year old. Mm -hmm because it speaks so much, I think, to some of the things we want to talk about today with the Bray School. How do we place value on education? Um, and when I say we, I should be clear that there are lots of different competing groups with competing ideas on the education at the Williamsburg Bray School, but central to that are the young children and the young boys that we're really going to be talking about today from the 1762 list, some of whom were actually, um, I mean, your age. Yeah. And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but you have um, two uh, family members that we know of currently that attended the Williamsburg Gray School in 1762. Yeah. yeah. So Elisha Jones and Mary Jones, who I'm going to talk a little bit about if, uh, if yeah. you're cool with that. Okay. So can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Great. So today we're talking specifically about one of the three lists that was part of the Williamsburg Bray School. For context, the Williamsburg Bray School was, um, by all accounts, the first official school for African Americans in colonial Virginia, although certainly those who were of African descent were being educated before, during, and after the tenure of the Williamsburg Bray School. But it ran for 14 years between 1760 and 1774. The sole teacher of the school was a woman by the name of Mrs. Ann Wager, who when I'm at Colony Williamsburg is usually the person I'm portraying. There were anywhere from 300, 350 to potentially up to 450 um, free and enslaved black children that were educated at this school. And most of them ranged in the ages three to 10, which we get from this earliest extant list. So that, again, again, as I mentioned, there are three lists of Bray School students, one from 1762, which we're going to talk about today, and then another one from 1765 and 1769. When you look at the breakdown of these students, first of all, we should be clear, in 18th century Williamsburg, over half of the population, anywhere from 52 to 54 percent of the population is Black, majority enslaved. Um, and the breakdown is that there are 57% of the community by 1775 are Black women in the city, um, very close followed behind by Black men. So it is Black men and women and their children who really um, create the majority population in 18th century Williamsburg. When you look at that at the Bray School, it breaks down mostly in terms of are you free or are you enslaved as identified on that list? Are you a boy? Are you a girl? Uh, and what age are you? Part of that is because the list was actually recorded by the trustees of the Williamsburg Bray School who were white and the school was a pro-slavery institution. 
So even though you have free and enslaved Black children being educated at the school, the people who are documenting and recording these lists, these students, how they define value at the school are predominantly white ultra elite men in 18th century Virginia. The reason I say this is because you can learn a lot from the student list itself. I've included all of the free black children on that breakdown, but of the boys, there was one, Alicia Jones, your ancestor. Uh, when it comes to boys versus girls, and I should say, I do wanna address my bias here. There are a couple of names who we're not sure if they're boys or girls or how they identify, but based on other research that I have done um, and other scholars have done, and in the case particularly of the names London, Shropshire, Aberdeen, and Ripon, we are making the assumption based on other research that they're likely boys. Although again, I don't know how these children self-identify. But you have about an even divide of boys and girls in that first list. And the youngest children are Rippon and John, who are three years old. And the oldest actually is a girl by the name of Elizabeth, but Aberdeen, who is part of the Craig household. When we're looking just at the ages of boys, they range between three and eight with the average age being seven. This is all wonderful information to have, but it doesn't actually encapsulate the lived experience of these boys. You can't encapsulate a lived experience by simply looking at a list and saying, great, you've learned everything we need to purely from the data. It tells us a lot, you know, who was in the classroom, what ages were they, what households were they coming from, but like what you were saying, Adam, with communities and generations of communities who share wealth and knowledge that are beyond what is purely on a list. And so with your permission today, that's what I'm gonna be talking about as part of the panel, which is both my research on the Williamsburg Gray School, but the lived experience of these boys specifically. Can you go to the next slide, Sarah? Thank you. So how do we do that? Well, I think first we have to address, acknowledge and reckon with the fact that archives and specifically Western archives are not created equal and that there is silencing to be found within those archives. Michel Rolf Triot wrote in 1995, it's a wonderful book, that the production of historical narratives involves the uneven contribution of competing groups and individuals who have unequal access to the means of such production. So what does that mean within the context of this Gray School list? As I mentioned before, it was written by the trustees of the Williamsburg Gray School. Those gentlemen who were a pretty much the top five wealthiest percent of the population in Virginia made the decisions on what was gonna be recorded in that list. Not necessarily what books the students were most interested in, their familial affiliations, how they got to school, but their ages, who enslaved them, and their name. But if we were to just stop there and say, well, this archive has been partially silenced, there's nothing else to learn, that really would not be either reflective of what we know historically and doesn't speak fully to the record itself and how you analyze a record that has silences like the Williamsburg Gray School. There's a lot of information actually about the Williamsburg Gray School, but it still creates silences nonetheless. Next slide, please. So one of the ways to address this silence is by using a couple of different theories, but one of my theorists who I particularly love is Marissa J. Fuentes. Now her research mostly focuses on Black women and Western archives and the violence that's placed upon them, but she shares a concept in this book um, that I think is really salient, which is something called the bias frame. So through the bias frame, you can see this, as she defines it, quote, specter of influence, end quote, of individuals who have been traditionally silenced within the archive. And I love to show it, I guess, visually, this is the best way. So you all are wearing clothing. There's a grain to the fabric, right? There's a weft and there's a weave. And if you pull along the bias of that grain, the weft and the weave, you can see things in the fabric. Um, there is visibility that comes through that you might not otherwise see. So how Marissa J. Fuentes proposes to see the bias frame of an archive is specifically addressing bias in documents. Who's writing the document? At what time? Under what context? Through this, we can learn more about these boys and their lived experience by simply acknowledging that not only is there a bias in the archives, but that actually it's pretty visible. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
I think also Leslie H. Harris words it perfectly when we're talking about the Bray Associates, who were the third largest charity in the Church of England in the 18th century. They were meant for um, providing indoctrination and inculcation, those are words they directly use, to those of African and mixed race, they describe it as mulatto descent within the British Empire to bring them to the established church, the Church of England. Now, this archive is extensively vast. Um, when I visited the University of Oxford, I had the chance to collect almost 8,000 pages of content, and it was a quarter of what they had in that archive. Nonetheless, I think you could misconstrue from that that either A, all voices are shared equally in this archive, or B, that it somehow is more perfect than other archives, oral histories, genealogical family history, speaking with community members like you, Adam, about well, your ancestor and other students on this list. And so I love that Leslie Harris, what she says is there is no perfect archive where every historical question is answered clearly and without the need for interpretation and imagination. There are only more or less difficult archives. And I think when we're looking at the Bray Associates and the Williamsburg Bray School, we have a vast amount of information on the Bray School statistically, we actually now through the Williamsburg Bray School Initiative have located the original Bray School building. That's a wonderful resource. But we still have to address the fact that the students' voices from the school do not come through as clearly as some other voices do. But nonetheless, we can still learn something about them. And I think the best way to do that is through historical imagination. Can you go to the next slide? So I'm sharing all these theorists with you in part so that I can then give context to the documents that I'm gonna be sharing with you and talking about those 14 young boys on the 1762 list. But one of the best, best ways I think to do it is through historical imagination. In fact, the last time I was in this room was with Antonio T. Bly when we did a Lemon Project panel in 2019. Tony Bly, as I know him, is the Peter H. Shattuck Endowed Chair in Colonial American History at Sacramento State. And he actually wrote a wonderful article on the Williamsburg Bray School called In Pursuit of Letters, a history of the Bray Schools for Enslaved Children in Colonial Virginia. But a lot of Tony's research focuses on either dealing with what we might define as incomplete archives or archives that are quite complete, but have intentionally silenced voices. And what he says, and I think this is a great way to think about the 1762 list as we proceed. Parts of the story we know because of documents. Other parts we do not. Despite the absence of manuscript and print, the past is still knowable. That is, if we are to apply common sense, reason, and imagination. So if you'll allow me, using the work of these theorists, I'm gonna ask you, to go on a journey through the documents with me that uses common sense, reason, and imagination to understand the lives of the Bray School students at the school in 1762 and their lived experience. Next slide. So where do I wanna start? Let's start with a typical day. What is a typical day? We still don't have all the resources and documents we want to know well, exactly what was every single student doing in the classroom. More research is ongoing, but we know that classes started at 6 a.m. in the spring and the summer and 7 a.m. in the fall and the winter. The transition normally being in that middle of that fall season as students are starting to attend, usually in September. So let's take the first day of school of the Williamsburg Bray School. 1762 list was written on September 30th of 1762, but the first day would have been the day before. September 29th, also known in the Church of England's liturgical calendar as Michaelmas, one of the holiest days in the church of the year. So we're starting on Sunday, early. For all of you who are here in the room, you know how hot Williamsburg can be still in late September, with a real feel of 80, 85, and 100% humidity. You're waking up at six o'clock in the morning. Oh, no, I take that back. You're probably waking up at half past four in the morning because from the historical records, we know very likely these boys and young girls were expected to get up and conduct labor on their master's and mistress's properties before they started school at 6 a.m. We also know from the record, although there's still some determination that needs to be done, that likely these students were not living 
at the Williamsburg Gray School, which was a 17 by 33 square foot building at this point in time. You can see it identified by the star on the map. But they're probably living up there in slavers' properties. So they get up at 430. In the case of many young children under the age of 10, based on historical records from Williamsburg, they're likely hauling firewood, hauling water, and then they start to walk down the street. They walk down likely that main street, Aberdeen all the way at Alexander Craig's home, he's a saddle maker, might take him longer to get to the school than perhaps John, who's from the Blair household. Mr. Blair Esquire is a member of the Board of Visitors at William and Mary and a member of the Governor's Council. So John, maybe he gets to the school earlier than Aberdeen. Maybe they arrive at the same time, we don't know, because I don't know with these particular students which ones were more diligent to get up and get ready for school. It depends. What I do know though, is that from all the way down to the Capitol, where you have Aberdeen, George, who was enslaved by Dr. Carter, a surgeon, John and Dick, who were enslaved by Mrs. Davenport, she's the mother of one of the professors at William and Mary, that it's about three quarters of a mile. As they're walking down, they're going to pass, and you can see it here, Palace Green, and before that, they're going to pass the courthouse. Right across from the courthouse is the market. The market is already well underway at that point in time. There are sights. There are smells. There are people haggling over, and we actually know this from primary source records with the Williamsburg Market, the issue of rotting fish that people are trying to cheat people with because they're putting butter on the eyes to make them look not as old as they are. <laughs> these kids are walking past these sights and these smells and this day and this humidity. All of this happens before they even get to the school. Then their day at the school begins. Now we know they're learning reading, possibly writing. Uh, they're learning spelling, sewing and knitting for the girls, doing very detailed sampler work, marking stitches, which in the 18th century, based on the extant samplers that we have, black or white for young girls, meant that your sampler was reversible, perfect on either side. The young boys are practicing their catechisms from the Church of England and looking at other documents. This is the start of the day. This is not necessarily explicit in the archive, but if we're talking about these boys and their experience, we should be explicit about it in this panel. So let's go to the next slide. We know um, from very, very detailed records from the Bray Associates, not only which books were being sent to the Williamsburg Bray School, but between 1760 and 1774, which, which books were repeat ordered. So you have all different kinds of books with interesting titles. Henry Dixon's The English Instructor, The Church Catechism Broke into Short Questions, A Friendly Admonition to Drinkers of Gin, Brandy, and Other Distilled Spiritus Liquors. That last one meant from a perhaps very racist reason for the adults and their parents. We don't know. But what I can tell you is what these books say. I've read them all very, very extensively. And when you read them, you have to read them not only for what they say, but how these young boys might experience them. So we know, according to the regulations of the Williamsburg Gray School from that same 1762 list, the students were included as well as a letter and the rules for the school, that they're supposed to learn the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. So how might a student, let's say um, John from the Blair household, who we know his uh, enslaver not only attended Bruton Parish regularly, but had several of his enslaved individuals baptized in that church. How might he read the 10 commandment, which is thou shall not kill, and see it in contradiction perhaps to an 18th century law he's familiar with, which is the 1669 law called the casual killing of slaves in which an enslaver in correcting his property can, well, if that property should perish as it's described in the law, it's not a crime. How is this seven, eight year old boy processing those two things? He lives in a household where his enslaver is in charge of changing and passing bills into law. There are lots of legal textbooks in that house but yet he's also learning these commandments at the same time that offer a contradictory lesson. How might somebody like uh, Alicia 
Jones, who's from a free black family who probably has to walk much further than all the other students because we don't know where he lived in Williamsburg. Most of the free black population lived outside the city proper. How might he look at Bacon's sermons to slaves and slave owners, which were published in the 1740s and 1750s by a Maryland Church of England rector known as Thomas, or pardon me, <clears throat> Thomas Bacon, whose brother Andrew Bacon was actually a great associate. How would he look at the, what says on page 39, he that can run can read, in contrast with which is on page 88, which is, quote, it is only their want of instruction which gives them such wrong notions of the faith they prove in baptism, and that this owing to nothing but the want of care in their owners to have them better taught. So essentially saying baptism does not make an enslaved person free or change the status of a free black. How might Alicia feel reading what's on page 39 and then looking less than 50 pages later in what's in the same textbook? How might somebody like Aberdeen, who's enslaved by Alexander Cray, who's a saddle maker, read Letter to an American Planter? It's the only text we know of that was published by a Bray associate directly, their secretary in 1771. The largest number of copies ever sent of this book were to Williamsburg out of anywhere in the world, in which it says that you should turn, quote, the eye service of slaves, end quote, to the, quote, conscientious diligence of servants, end quote, by having them attend the Bray School. How are these texts, which we have in the archive, speaking to these boys? We don't have definitive answers, but the question should be asked nonetheless to create, I won't say balance, because I don't think you can ever create a perfect balance back into the archive, but a level of equity that quite frankly should be there. Next slide, please. The other thing too, is you're looking at these students in a classroom. You have 17 by 33 feet, right? That's smaller than the rooms that we're in combined. It's actually smaller than one of these rooms. <laughs> you have 30 children and a teacher ranging between ages three and 10. Yes, they're certainly reading Psalters and Bibles, but the majority of their texts are primers and early spelling books. Do they have enough? What happens when most of these primers and tracks, which are stitched together rather than having leather bindings, get ripped? Does it cause children to argue? Does it cause the teacher to argue? What does that look like? Even looking at the breakdown of textbooks and knowing how they were bound tells you something about the makeup of the classroom. But what I really want to end my part of the panel with is talking about some particular students. I've already mentioned several of their names, but some particular students and how their education might have impacted them later in their life. Again, we don't have definitive answers, but if you look at the world, and I know Maureen will talk about that more, if you look at the world of these students, you can still ask critical questions that speak to these young boys as they grow into Black men. What does that world look like for them? Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with Harry. Harry was five years old when he attended the Bray School in 1762, which would have made him 15 in 1772. He was enslaved by Thomas Everard and possibly later by Francis Horrocks, who was the daughter and the wife of a rector of Bruton Parish, Reverend Horrocks. Also, he may have ended up in the household of Martha, uh, Martha Everard, who was later the wife of Dr. Isaac Hall in Petersburg. I don't know exactly where Harry is in 1774 after Thomas Everard passes away and Francis. But what I can tell you is in 1772, it seems likely that he's still living in Williamsburg. And if he is, then he's very familiar with the network of kin, both his own and that of Mr. Everard surrounding that house. If you've ever been to Williamsburg, the Everard house is if you're looking at the governor's mansion, it's the little white house with Spanish red shutters to your right. Conversations are happening in that house and enslaved individuals, especially these boys who are often being sent to the Bray School to train as manservants, footmen, waiting men, keeping accounts in highly elite households would be privy to conversations. And in the case of Harry, I have to imagine that he was privy to a conversation about the Somerset case. For those of you who don't know, and I'm taking specifically from George Van Cleve's wonderful article on this, the Somerset case, or pardon me, James Somerset was taken from Africa and enslaved in 1749. He was sold in Virginia to Charles Stewart, 
a Scottish merchant and slave trader in Norfolk. In 1769, Stuart took Somerset with him to England. After two years in England, Somerset escaped from Stuart, but was eventually recaptured. Stuart decided to sell Somerset in punishment back into slavery in Jamaica. However, a very early group of British abolitionists intercedes, and they actually reclaim Somerset, and a court, in, a court case ensues in England known as Somerset v. Stuart. And in 1772, Lord Mansfield actually decides in favor of James Somerset that he cannot be removed from English soil. Again, seen by George Van Cleve, the proceedings in the Somerset case were reported in at least 13 British newspapers, several widely circulated magazines, and 22 out of 24 operating North American colonial newspapers. It makes international headlines, especially in Virginia, because Charles Stewart comes from Norfolk. The reason this is important is that Frances Everard and her husband, Reverend Horrocks, when they visit England to visit the Bishop of London, just so you know that the rector of Luton Parish is usually the representative, the commissary to the Bishop of London in 18th century Virginia. They do not take any enslaved individuals with them for fear that they may not return with them. How might Harry feel about this? How might Harry feel about Reverend Horrocks, the minister of his parish, technically, in attending the Bray School? And knowing this law is in direct contradiction to the world around him. Another case, which I think is really important, is that of Roger. Roger was seven years old in 1762, which would make him 17 in 1772. I'm doing math off the fly. Math is not my strong suit as a historian. <laughs> and 20 in 1775. Roger was training likely to be a waiting man or a footman at Peyton Randolph Esquire's home, the Randolph House, which is a large Spanish red house behind the courthouse in Williamsburg. However, Roger was sold on December 21st of 1775 to a man named David Ross in order to help compensate losses for Peyton Randolph's estate after he died in 1775. How might Roger feel on that day, December 21st? separated from everything he's ever known on that property. Also having been taught, you are part of God's communion at the Bray School, but knowing that his value as an enslaved piece of property was valued higher that day. Next slide. And then we come to craftsmanship and human cost. I love talking about Aberdeen. I've mentioned him a couple of times before. He was enslaved by Alexander Craig, a tradesman in the city who was a saddle maker. There are many tradesmen and women who utilize the Bray School, not just the ultra elite like Blair and Randolph. Although Alexander Craig died in 1771, he had a successful business prior to that. And the heart of his business surrounds craftsmanship and transportation. As Alexander was being sent to the Bray School to learn to read and write, those skills would have been expected in an apprentice trade, a highly skilled apprentice trade like saddle making. Was Aberdeen eventually required by his master to make saddles? How would he have felt about knowing he's participating in a craftsmanship world of transportation that he himself cannot necessarily access? All of these questions arise through his literacy. And then the last student I want to talk about is John. John was three years old when he attended the Williamsburg Bray School. He was one of the youngest. From the research that I've been able to decipher, I've actually, very fortunately, been able to narrow down um, one of his two mothers. It was either Flora at the Orr household or Sarah. I'm not sure which, but I'm still doing work. Flora and Sarah also had four other children combined. Sarah was the mother of Sal, also known as Sarah, and James, a girl and a boy. And Flora was the mother of Pat, who was a girl, and Jack, a boy. This also comes from all of the inventory lists of Captain Orr. This household was a household run by a blacksmith, a tradesman in the city. But John disappears from the record after the 1762 list. Whether he was sold or he passed away, I don't know. But I think about him a great deal because Sal, James, Pat, and Jack would also later attend the Bray School. How would Sarah and Flora have felt about all five of their children attending this school? Did it bring them joy? Or were they worried that it would make the boys so valuable they might later be sold? Again, I don't have answers. 
but it's important to think about this in context of the world to truly build a complete picture of the archive of the Bray Associates and the Williamsburg Bray School. That being said, I'm gonna pass it on to Maureen, who's gonna talk more about the world. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have to say that really this, this is a pleasure to be on this panel, but I really have to say also that I have the incredible privilege of serving as the director of the William Mary Bray School Lab. I really think it is, it is one of the most incredible professional privileges I've had. So I, like Adam says, I don't take this lightly either. Um, I'm just gonna quickly mention something and I invite everyone, whether you are in the room with us right now or whether you are attending virtually um, to visit the Bray School Lab um, web, web pages. So that's at William Mary's website. So www.wm.edu. And if you just put Bray, in the search um, line, you'll get the option for Bray School Lab. And we've got a lot there. We've been really busy the last uh, few uh, weeks and so. Um, so we have a blog, we have videos of um, our past meet and greet, Nicole's um, Lemon uh, Porch Talk, or Project Porch Talk, as early this year is there, and we're adding, adding. So I really invite you to visit that and then revisit um, periodically because we are adding new material. Um, Adam, through his comments, and I love that picture. I don't have anymore, but that picture of you at eight, I'm loving that picture. Such a good picture. Um, but, and then also, um, Nicole's work tells us that students are at the center of the history of the school, and the student lists are at the heart of the research that we are doing um, with the Bray School Lab. I'm going to take a few minutes because I don't want to labor over this long because I really want to get to the conversation. And I know that we could be here a lot longer, but we don't have an infinite amount of time. So, um, I want to talk about some context and also tensions when we talk about the boys at um, the Bray School. So in our next uh, image, we have, if you can move to the next one. Yes, we have not a perfect image, and this is actually a cropped image, but um, it draws your attention to a, a really important source, online source, the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. Um, slavevoyages.org, a hugely collaborative project that is housed at Emory University, um, but it's interactive and it allows you to look at the Atlantic Slave Trade base, but, uh, database, but also through different selections, you can kind of pare the, the findings down to um, a smaller geographic region and also a very specific period of time. So what you have in a, in a, in a nutshell here is image information for the year 1762, the year of the 1762 list. Um, as Nicole said, there are three lists that we know of. And so when we look at those lists, the 1762 list is unique because it's the only one that we know of that lists the ages of the boys. So when we talk about an age range of three to 10, we are taking it from that 1762 list, journalizing back through 1761 and 1760, the first year of the school, and then all the way through 1774, the last year. We are hopeful that we will find other lists and certainly more information, even if we have to parse it from other uh, sources. But in 1762, this is for Chesapeake. This is as, as specific as I could get using this tool. Um, we know that the United States was not the center of the Atlantic slave trade. We're reminded of it in terms of these numbers. Um, but for 1762, we look at and we get a number of just over 4,000 Africans who left involuntarily the continent of Africa, many of them from Angola, we know from the research, um, for ultimately what would be the Chesapeake region and close to, but not quite close to 3,200 actually make it which gives us a mortality rate of roughly 20%. Um, so there is some value to be gleaned in terms of thinking about the Middle Passage. Um, Dr. Daniel Black, love Dr. Black, one of my former professors at Clark Atlanta University, um, talked about the Middle Passage yesterday and really thinking about that experience. And, it's, and really it's not on a best day one that we wanna think about. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not at the center of the trade in Virginia, but we are in the trade, most certainly. And the 18th century is the high water mark, um, if I can use that phrase. 
um, for the volume. We see more Africans transported from Africa to the Americas under the trade during the 1800s or 18th century, 1700s, um, than any century. So we have to think about it in that larger context, even if Virginia is not in the center. We know that the vast majority are taken to the Caribbean and also to South America, particularly Brazil. Um, in our next two slides, we see the names of the students. Um, and just let you sit with them. Nicole has given us a great sketch of some of their lives and um, just want to acknowledge them. On the bottom of that uh, first slide, we have Elisha Jones, who is free and the only boy on the list that is free. The next slide continues those names. And you see those um, names is very easy to look at Robert and George um, and Harry, but we look at Aberdeen and we look at Shropshire and we look at Ripon and we have to make um, some judgments based on research um, pertaining to the grade school and the grade associates. So we always wanna keep the children um, in the center. Interestingly enough, the, um, the records refer to them consistently as scholars. Mm -hmm. So when they cross that threshold, whether it's 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., their identity changes, it shifts somewhat. They are referred to by the trustees of the Bray School and by the Bray Associates as scholars, which is really pretty dynamic and pushes back against certainly their legal position as chattel, as personal movable property. They're scholars. And I think that's also a point of, for me, it's a point of pride, thinking about this as the history of Black children in the diaspora, in colonial, um, colonial Williamsburg, in colonial Virginia, but in the diaspora, these children are scholars. It's aspirational, but it also creates other tensions that I'll talk about shortly because there's always the question of what is the intellectual capabilities of these children as being African descended. What is the, because we know, we know that contemporary writing talks about an intellectual ceiling, if you would. And there is a focus on black bodies and what black bodies can do physically. And there is a lack of emphasis on what they can do intellectually. So there's some really interesting tensions that are operating even in the fact that they referred repeatedly as scholars. In our next slide, and next two slides, um, again, just giving some context, not the best, um, but it does give us some sense of what's happening around the children. Um, Africans are arriving. They are, they have survived against some great odds, have arrived and are um, disembarked in Virginia. So we have an ad from the Virginia Gazette, November 1763, just the next year. Um, the Virginia Gazette is very spotty. Um, in the early 1760s because of the change in turnover and ownership. William Hunter, who um, actually is a early trustee, um, passes away and the ownership and operation of the Gazette shifts. And there's just not a lot of surviving copies from the very early 1760s. So we try to find copies that are as close to 1762 as we can. But we know that Africans are arriving. They're arriving from their um, referred to as choice, healthy, windward coast slaves. Um, and this is taking place in 1763. So we can tie this to the slave trade. The next slide, our next image, um, also shows us a different kind of value. So Africans are arriving, they are valued, they are sold, they are running away as well. And there is a value that is being articulated also. Their value is being activated um, also in a different way when they run away because there are rewards there is the potential loss of an asset and the value, not just of that asset at the moment, but as uh, the value of that asset over time, in essence, thinking about children or younger men running away and the loss of that asset now, but also the loss of that labor, any labor um, that may be lost if that person is not returned or just in the interim until they are perhaps returned. So that value is activated to the public in different ways. And of course the public is, warned against harboring um, runaways, and typically they're incentivized financially to return runaways. And then our last image really brings forth some of the tensions that we see in value. So they are human, clearly, first and foremost human, but their legal status is that of chattel. So they are property. 
And it's really interesting in some of the primary documents that the trustees and the Bray Associates grapple with this because there is, there is a statement that we have to remember that they are people, even in the midst of their chattel status. They are children, three to 10, who will become, God willing, and if, you know, um, if we think about mortality, right, it's not promised, but they will likely live to some um, level of adulthood. So they are adults to be in their labor and their value will go up over time. They are in an international trade, but also part of a domestic trade. Um, the Atlantic slave trade is still wide open at this point, And there is no vision that the uh, trade is going to close, even though it will in a matter of uh, decades. The domestic trade is not nearly at its height, but we know that a trade is going on domestically. People are being sold for uh, debts. Um, to settle claims against uh, states for being troublesome property. So we know there's a domestic trade. Um, productive and reproductive labor. These are boys who become men. And there's this division. We talk about reproductive labor in terms of women and uh, birthing the next generation of slaves, right? birthing their replacements. Um, and how the law that the child follows the condition of the mother really makes men invisible as fathers under slavery, right? Um, the individual versus community, the scholar versus the physical body, white versus black, free versus enslaved. And I use this idea of tensions, but we can also look at it differently. Um, and I again, harken back to yesterday's plenary session, thinking about multiple identities. Um, layers of identities. So we kind of think about Venn diagrams and where there's overlap and where there's distinction. So there's lots of ways to think about it, all of which are complicated. So we have financial identities, we have spiritual and religious identities. And as much as the Bray Associates focused on the Book of Common Prayer, for example, as a, as a central document and really expanding um, the Church of England and by extension the body of Christ, there was no threat to the institution of slavery. We are almost 100 years after the 1667 law that says baptism does not alter the status of a person, of a slave, right? Does not alter one's status as to slave or free. There is no way that this school is going to unseat slavery in Virginia, um, but there are tensions. The question of literacy, and taking the literacy to the community and to one's household, and also um, the pessimism of the trustees about the lasting value of this education when it comes up against what are seen as kind of the corrupting influences that um, enslaved children went back to. And finally, because there was no property right in oneself, so Eric Foner talks about freedom, the, the litmus test of freedom, property rights in oneself, and the ability to enjoy the fruits of one's labor. Um, both of those are absent in the lives of these children. Um, and it just makes us really think about all these different tensions and identities um, that are operating through the 1762 list and, and through the lives of these boys who become men over time. And I want to questions. Yes. yes. Of course, you have your hand for this. And then certainly for questions uh, from the audience as well as those who are on Zoom, feel free to type your questions into the uh, into the chat. Um, we'll open it up to the audience here. I know that the Bray School stopped in about 1774. Mm -hmm. Is there any other did it ever start back up again? Yeah. So the question was, um, the Bray School operated between 1760 to 1774. Did it ever reopen post-American Revolution? No. However, a lot of other Bray Schools did with mostly Black loyalist teachers teaching at them. Um, this is part of my ongoing research. Um, but since I've been able to access some of the archives, what I have discovered is when you're looking at the 
I'll first I'll address the Bray Associates and then I'll address black literacy broadly in colonial Virginia. So when you're looking at the Bray Associates, you see several different schools in Nova Scotia and the Caribbean and later um, they have reached reach as far as Africa, Australia, Mongolia, Singapore, and Japan. The Bray Associates have a reach of schools. But the ones in Nova Scotia and the Caribbean post-American revolution, and actually Philadelphia reopens in 1786, are all um, either moving in the direction or are, are, are already abolitionist. Majority of them run by Black loyalists who have emigrated. Um, or, in the case of the Philadelphia Brave School, it was actually run by Absalom Jones, who along with Richard Allen started the first um, AME church up in Philadelphia. Um, when it comes to the Brave School in Virginia though, and actually all Brave Schools, because there were several attempts across Virginia to establish schools in Fredericksburg, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Orange County, King George County, and Yorktown. The Fredericksburg Brave School is the only one that operates between 63 and 70, realistically. And all the other ones are either, they receive explicit letters detailing the Bray Associates, why they will never open the schools or they don't bother responding. So when it comes to the Williamsburg Bray School, one of the reasons it doesn't reopen is because of the crumbling of the Church of England. But we shouldn't conflate that with no black education in Williamsburg. Post-American revolution, it's obviously not only a political revolution, but a religious revolution. And you have other churches like First Baptist and later New Zion and Mount Arid and Chickahominy uh, taking up the mantle of that education. And it seems very likely that some of the enslaved individuals who attended the Bray School may later have been congregates of First Baptist and those offshoots. But you also have to look at the Methodists as well the Lutherans, the Swedenborgians, the Moravians, the Presbyterians. Um, there are other educational outlets for those who were either currently or formerly enslaved, um, but they are not being led by the Church of England or the Bray Associate as we see it. So it's an ongoing research topic for me, but I hope that answers your question. I have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> What was the main focus of the school? I mean, I'm sure they didn't do it just because they just cared that much for the school, but what was their goal? Yes, you're asking about the purpose of the school. Which kind of plants into a question that I wanted to, a statement in the question, yeah. ties into that, in that the story, it has the propensity to be romanticized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but this was not an environment, this was not, this was a missed education, I would call it as Carnegie Woodson. States and this was not about uplift. <laughs> this was about indoctrination with racist I ideas. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would like, and I know you've laid, laid out a lot of evidence, the contradictions have come out. I want to you know if you can give some context drawn from your question about yeah. the Bray School. The book is a way that speaks against this romanticized idea. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I will obviously pass off the microphone both to Maureen and Adam, who I know certainly um, uh, we discussed this extensively. It's actually why we picked the title we did, Invaluable Within in Parentheses, because the idea of value, not just value in education, but why you're educating an enslaved individual um, or a free Black child stems largely from the fact that the, all the Bray schools in 18th century uh, British North America, Philadelphia, New York City, Newport, Rhode Island, and Williamsburg. They were the four major schools, all in cities. So it's an urban environment. So if you look at the names of the students on this list, right, you have Rippon, who's enslaved by Anthony Kay. He's a cabinet maker, a highly skilled cabinet maker. You have London and Aggie and Shropshire, who are enslaved by Christiana Campbell, one of the wealthiest tavern keepers in Williamsburg, and I would argue in colonial Virginia. So you have a lot of these children who outside of, and I try to suss out outside of this, how they may have seen the value of their education. The enslavers who are sending them are looking to increase property value because enslaved individuals in urban environments who can read and or write can be sold for more money. So this is where you see those tensions that Maureen talked about us. What are the students doing with the value of their education in direct opposition to enslavers and also in direct opposition to the Church of England because the Bray Associates uh, who are all based in London 
had very different opinions of what the school was supposed to do than the enslavers in Williamsburg. And one of the most contentious and nastiest um, writing correspondences I've ever seen <laughs> stems from this question to the Williamsburg Gray School trustees. I have one other question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one other question. Um, this is for Adam. How how long have you known that you were related uh, or that um, what is it with you, Eliza Elixir? Mm -hmm. How long have you known that Isaac Johnson? And is that part of Lafayette Jones? Yeah, Lafayette Jones part of my family. So, <laughs> yeah, he, part, he part of my family. Yeah. So uh, so Williamsburg is already only but so big. So you throw a rock, you're gonna hit a cousin. Um, you go down to Charles City, you look at Samaria Baptist Church, you look at First Baptist Church, uh, you know, you're going to find you know, like Slab Town where my aunt Flossy Banks was, and people are going to start talking, putting names together. Carter's Grove, there was a lady that was on one of the uh, rolls uh, that we looked, and we saw her last name was Canada, so it was like, mm, that name, you know, not just going to pop up out of nowhere. So we looked there, and from that candidate, it led it to a, to a Kennedy, then then to to a Brown, then back to a Jones. Names are always like reoccurring. So prime examples like Peyton Randolph, Randolph Peyton. You know, people get creative off and they get creative, and they just you know switch the order of it around. But if you take a highlighter and you're willing to really like just look at it, you'll start to see okay, this was uptown, this was downtown. So and. Then other, you start to look at it as well. You see where DNA starts to, you know, change the course of what that person looks like. Light skin, dark skin. The educated, not educated, as someone else would say. Not saying that they were dumb, but like Nicole and Maureen are getting to, you know, seeing the value on that the separation. The people don't go anywhere. Then the best thing to tie it all together was a death certificate and obituaries because who shows up at the funerals? It's like, mm, your family showed up there. So that's how I was able to put that together. My brother Devin uh, did a little bit more on it. My sister Brittany and my mother. Uh, so we all did that along with Miss Wyoming uh, Ingram. And after we started looking at that, uh, we just started going up the old folks that were still alive and asking them who they, who they knew, who they didn't know. And when they got to certain points where they stopped talking, it let me know, up oh, were we on to something? Because then it just proved that, okay, that was another cousin that you don't want to, you don't want to admit via, you know, slavery that there's a tie to. Um, and for, as I say, there's, there's a forced trauma that's there. Um, anybody that's black that's in Williamsburg, your history is gonna go to a point and then it's gonna get uncomfortable to the point where are you really, really willing to keep turning that page back because it's gonna re reveal some layers on that onion that's gonna probably make everybody you know, cry um, and they're probably not gonna be the easiest to handle. So that's how we were able to find ours. And I hate to cut us short, but we have another presentation at 2 p.m. Um, yeah. Can you uh, get the next one at 2? I mean, at 2 p.m.? So we can have, like, like, one more question. Can we have one or two more questions? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Let's pick that up. Okay. And I, I, we have more room thing in the chat? Yeah. Let's see. So we have a comment from uh, Terry Myers. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, let's see. But not so much a question as an observation that it might be worth discussion on the intellectual capabilities um, of the scholars of the grade school. Benjamin Franklin was deeply impressed and perhaps surprised at how well the students of Philadelphia grade school did. That probably encouraged him in joining the associates of Dr. Gray in London and then um, in suggesting Williamsburg as a site for another grade school. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and thank you, Terry. And we have to we have to re recognize the contributions of Terry Myers because without Terry's work, we wouldn't be having this panel. Um, it's Terry's work that helped helped lead to the discovery of the original Gray School. Um, it's the um, path of research that he has given us over his um, career. He's professor emeritus at Rome Mary in the English department, but it has work in. Um, English writing led him on a path that ultimately led to the great school. Um, I want to, because I love context, context is everything to me. Um, if we look at the 17th century, we have, we have to still put these things in context. Um, we've got the writings of Thomas Jefferson, um, 
who talks about blacks in a certain way in terms of certain um, intellectual ceiling. Those, those are my terms, not his terms, uh, my interpretation of that. But we also have the rights of people like Charles White, um, European, who's talking about um, this spectrum of people. And he places Africans as the intimate, as the um, African Africans and people as the intermediaries between Europeans and apes. And he writes that they are closer to apes than to Europeans. And he places Native Americans closer to Europeans. And, and again, my interpretation, I don't recall if he uses terms about this idea of the, this noble savage. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certain redeeming qualities that he saw in Native Americans that were not there in Africans. So we can't forget that those ideas are circulating and those are informing um, decisions. Perception informs policy. And we can't negate that. Um, in this larger conversation. I also wanted to ask about, I mean, the evidences of those students who may have used this education that they were receiving as a tool of resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to talk about that. Um, I think, first of all, there are many different ways in which resistance can manifest. It can be um to the eyes of anglo-americans very very obvious through a runaway ad or much much more subtle um and i would love to give two sort of contrasting examples because i would argue um as research continues we'll find many 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 more examples of them that are explicit in the archive but uh two examples are isaac b and hannah isaac b is a very interesting individual he is enslaved but his father's free black men joan in john in b also related to the rollinson family and flowers family so uh, his father is a free black man in williamsburg he's actually the only person that ann wager the teacher of the williamsburg Gray school we ever know takes to court don't know why but we know that she does um his mother, from the wonderful research, I should give credit to Julie Richter here, is likely a woman by the name of Fanny, who is an enslaved cook, the enslaved cook in the Blair household. He has two sisters that we definitively know of, Clara and Joanna, as well. Isaac runs not once, but twice, actually. Uh, he runs in 1774 when John Blair Sr. Uh, passes away. And he is transferred as quote unquote property to Lewis Burrell, who is one of his grandsons in Mecklenburg County. He is later recaptured based on the tax records. But again, I wanna give credit where credit is due. Mick Nichols and Julie Richter a few years ago found another runaway act for Isaac B. The reason it had been missed in the archive is because his name was misspelled by one letter. It mentions in that runaway act that he can read and write uh, he is valued for less than the saddlebags that he was caught with or took with him, I would say. And that's when he last appears on the record. Um, I think this is significant because it's not necessarily where his story ends, but in the case of an individual who has to make a choice to self-emancipate, you're successful if no one ever sees you again. And I cannot imagine how excruciatingly painful that decision was for him because we also know he left behind a son by the name of John B, maybe after his own father in Mecklenburg, although it doesn't seem by choice. Hannah is another great example. Actually, she is enslaved by Robert Carter Nicholas, who is one of the most prolific trustees of the Williamsburg Gray School. She shows up on the 1762 list. She's seven years old. And she is the only enslaved individual that we know of that Robert Carter Nicholas sent prior to 1769, which means that it's very likely uh, that it is she who he is referencing in a letter from 1765. He essentially says um, to the effect of, he speaks a little bit Maureen, like what you had said before of, I really, I, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially I would like if we could separate all these children from their black communities because they go back and then learn as he defines it, bad manners. And he describes him, he says, I have a girl I sent to my school, I have a girl I own that was sent to school upwards of three years. Um, but he describes her as, quote, a sad jade, which is, end quote, um, unfortunately, it refers to her as an old horse. She's 10 at this point in time. And he also describes that the school doesn't reform her. The word he uses is reform in the way he would like. Now, to our knowledge, she doesn't 
just from the research I've done, sell Hannah at this point in time, but he's irritated enough that she is placing a different value in her education than what he had prescribed as the value to write about it in a letter to somebody back to London. But again, this is where you have to look at the bias grain because Hannah's resistance may not at first glance appear as explicit as Isaac's, but if you really look at the letter in context, it is referring to Hannah and her resistance is just as palpable as Isaac's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to add, because um, I talked about Eric Kohner and the litmus test of freedom and the absence of freedom. So property rights in oneself, the right to enjoy the fruits of one's labor, those were denied, but no one can own these children's minds. And I think that Hannah helps uh, illustrate that as well yes. as I would be either in the moment of, of um, their education or for the years after. Mm -hmm. We also had a someone in the chat um, from one of the near the extent relatives of Isaac and Sophie who I contacted some months ago. Yeah. And Nicole knows him. David Lambert, who say that he will be sending soon a proof that the mother of Insco B. the Insco B. children was Mary B., the daughter of Cleopatra B., who was indentured until the age of 31 to John Blair. And her children were by law also indentured to age 31. So exciting. <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm so excited. This actually brings up if, yeah, if you believe yourself to be a descendant, you know yourself to be a descendant please contact us. We'd love to talk to you. We'd And more importantly, we'd love to make sure that you have the resources you want to tell your story and your family story the way you want it told. So you can reach out to us at raylab at wm.edu um, because we are still learning about more descendants. I think more importantly, Descendants are identifying themselves. We're still doing work and we are following just so you know, you can find it on our webpage, the descendant engagement rubric set up by the first national summit on teaching slavery from 2018. You can find the rubric that we're following on our webpage, but please, please, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you um, and love to make sure that we are supporting you in the way you would like to be supported. Yeah, oh, I just had one question. First of all, this is an excellent Maureen, you said that there were four grade schools, Philadelphia, Newport, Rhode Island, New York City, and Williamsburg. Have any of those other grade schools been located? Or is Williamsburg the only one that has been able to locate the, the building where the grade school was uh, held? Sure, I think that was Nicole's conversation, but... Um, so we recognize that, and, and Nicole had said that those were the four primary and, the, and really the most successful, yeah. I think we can say in different terms, um, in the colonial US. Um, in terms of the other schools, oftentimes it is um, a knowledge of where they stood based on the record. But again, our, our distinction for the Williamsburg Gray School is the oldest extant building mm -hmm. um, used exclusively for a school for black children. So we're, there are certain kind of caveats. We have to be very careful about our language and be very precise. So extant, so still standing um, school with the exclusive purpose of um, serving as a school during its time. We know that the, um, that the structure, the 17 by 33 tenement building was built as a house. And so it is very much, um, the, the architecture is very much a house with um, a central passageway and room, one room on either side of that central passageway, and then um, an upper uh, level, which we believe is where Anne Major lived. Yeah. So there's certain things that we can say about the Williamsburg School that is distinct from others, but we don't want to kind of overestimate its place in the history of the Great Schools colonially because we know it was not the first um, operating, but we have the incredible. Um, opportunity to really investigate the extant building and, and Colonial Williamsburg with its absolute expertise um, as a world-class um, living history museum uh, is doing that. And we just are so excited to be part of that. All right, I think that concludes our session. Thanks again. Thank to all you. So
excited that David, 